um, so we, uh, my presentation is mostly about global picture, large scale picture, but, uh, so we run global models. But we have to pay attention to, to small details like mixing processes, working on a centimeter or even smaller scales, and also uh, gradients, oxyclients, nutriclients, and so on. So we try to combine these uh, two very, very different scales. Oops. So the picture global, yeah, Denise showed that already. So we have a natural um, low oxygen environments in the global ocean, particularly in the eastern, on the eastern margins uh, of the oceans, um, the tropical, subtropical oceans of Peru, of uh, Mexico, California, in the Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea, but also in the Atlantic, not so pronounced. The Atlantic overall has, on average, has more oxygen than the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is an interesting observation. Uh, there are many reasons. Uh, conveyor belt circulation, Wally Broker's uh, uh, picture plays an important role. And I, I was lucky enough to meet him last week. He was still very, very active and pushing things and uh, motivating scientists. Excellent uh, person and uh, I'm very, well, uh, proud to, to, to have known him. And we all have to carry on and uh, move uh, science forward in the interest of, of uh, our society. So oxygen, uh, the inventory here, there's a small number or a large number, whatever you want to be, uh, in, in terms of petamols, 227, is in the ocean of oxygen. The atmosphere is most of the oxygen, so 99.4%. Uh, so whatever happens in the, in the ocean about oxygen, we will still be able to breathe for a while, a very long while. So that's, uh, we don't have to, to worry from that perspective. That's the first positive news. Um, the, the mechanism, how does this large pool of oxygen in the atmosphere affect the ocean? That's the, the interesting part here. And there's um, oxygen uptake at the surface in the mixed layer. Uh, then transport with the ocean currents, with mixing and advection into the interior, and uh, all the way consumption, rain down of, uh, or well, uh, circulation, dissolved organic matter, particulate organic matter is respired and consumes oxygen away. Um, and with uh, climate change and particularly global warming, we see that uptake uh, will be reduced, that's what we expect, so less solubility, uh, the gas, um, the, the amount of gas, water, warmer water can hold decreases with temperatures, that's the champagne bottle effect, so there were less oxygen going in, and on net more oxygen bubbling out. Second part is transport, that's, we expect that will be reduced because the, the ocean warms from the top, so a lid of light, warm water is sealing off the ocean interior. So this transport pathway will become more difficult. We need more energy to bring water down. And uh, that depends on winds and so on. We will have to, that discussion. And then uh, third part, oxygen consumption. There we don't know so much. So of course, respiration rates will increase. That's a metabolic effect. But uh, usually oxygen consumption in the global ocean is not uh, rate limited, it's substrate limited. So it depends on how much organic matter we form. And this depends on how much nutrients can be brought into the light. And that might well go down because there's less uh, production and less nutrients coming through the more stratified thermocline in the warmer, warming world at least. So there's a question mark. And we can now look at that uh, in our models and a first conceptual picture that we, well, derived, informed by numerical modeling is, is here. So this is a transect through the ocean from south to north, in the middle of the equator, and the, uh, the thermocline is shown, so the upper few hundred meters, really, in this picture. This is the world before warming, and once we warm, uh, everything becomes warmer, so the red, red lines here and everything is more stratified, so the, all the isopignals will move up a little bit and move uh, poleward. This is the enhanced stratification effect. There's another effect, less mixing then, because the uh, density stratification is sharper and we need more energy to steer it. And for the same level of energy put in by tides, by wind, uh, there will be less steering, less mixing. So this is an effect we see. And so all these shallow isopignals in the thermocline uh, move closer to the surface. 
they narrow down into tighter uh, spaces, density spaces, these red ones. And if we have the same winds still, winds pump water with Ekman subduction, Ekman pumping, and then the same transport of water pumped into the ocean here has to move through a smaller uh, uh, depth horizon, so it has to move faster. So the transport velocity increases because the space that can be occupied by this transport is smaller and in a warmer ocean. And so we should even see high oxygen levels. And that was one of the questions I think uh, you referred to. And that's what we see in our models. So first effect, this solubility effect, just uh, the gas solubility. And here we can model argon or abiotic oxygen in the models. And then we see it goes down blue color everywhere. So oxygen levels decrease in the global ocean. Uh, but if we uh, look into this warming effect on circulation, on transport, then the models show indeed this is for fixed winds, so the winds have atmosphere uh, circulation is kept fixed at uh, present day values, and we model just the warming effect, the enhanced stratification effect, and this speeding up of subduction in the thermocline of the transport in this narrower space for ventilation for thermocline circulation. And this results in enhanced oxygen values in the tropical oceans because there, the water didn't have enough time to accumulate the same respiration signal, and it arrives with higher oxygen levels, even though it has warmer, and this uh, exceeds the solubility effect here that we see in this warming world. That's models, and now we have reality. And there we see, unfortunately, the color scale is now opposite. The uh, red color here is deoxygenation, so the alarming signal that we wanted to transport, or the authors here wanted to transport. Um, so this picture shows a decline of oxygen almost everywhere, including the tropical oceans. And that means another mechanism, not only solubility and this transport effect, but also either wind effects, so changes in atmospheric circulation, or biological effects come into play here. And this is di more difficult to disentangle. But the picture here is um, decline essentially everywhere. Um, and uh, it's quite drastic, so it's 2% decline of the ocean oxygen inventory over the last 50 years. So extrapolating this into the future would uh, bring the ocean life to an end in uh, two, two and a half, five, two, uh, two and a half thousand years, which wouldn't be too good. But there are feedbacks in the system, and I will uh, come to a few of these. We see particularly high oxygen loss in the Arctic, so there's lots of changes going on in the Arctic, more production, more respiration. This could, could be an effect here in the equatorial Pacific. Southern Ocean as well, very interesting. There are lots of changes going on there in terms of also carbon uptake, CO2 uptake, a very important domain. But also oxygen, this was surprising, that, uh, and also South Atlantic uh, a surprise as well. And the data compilation, this uh, shows up as a well, point of um, above average oxygen loss. Interestingly, the North Atlantic, or perhaps the most, the best studied region in the global ocean, doesn't, doesn't show a very significant oxygen decline. So it's a below average, an, an, an anomalous ocean basin. And so we should maybe not infer global ocean properties from uh, studying the North Atlantic alone. So what do the models say? Now we have seen a few models, uh, well, model studies about processes and a global picture from data. And uh, unfortunately, the models do not at all disagree. Uh, do, do not at all agree. So there's a huge discrepancy. These are the IPCC models, the most recent IPCC report, uh, CMAP5 models. And they show all a decline in oxygen. This is up to today, but then also for the future of the century. With increasing warming, we see an increasing decline of oxygen. But none of these models gets a 2% decline. So they are more, have a 0.3 uh, um, per, uh, petamol per decade, so that's 0.6%. So an underestimate by factor 2 to 3, by essentially all the models. And uh, this is a systematic deficiency, apparently. And we still haven't found a solution for this. So we, we tried, this is the observational estimate, 
decline over the last uh, decades, five decades. And these are all the IPCC models. Uh, one gets close, but for the wrong reasons. Uh, this is uh, this model that shows a decline in the 60s here for, because the spin-up was not done uh, long enough, I think. So this is an, an outlier we shouldn't consider too much. But we tried also in Kiel with, with our models to do sensitivity studies, changing mixing parameterization, changing uh, biology, stoichiometry, response to carbon fertilization, uh, many, many different ideas we came up, but none of them went all the way to this 2% decline over the last 50 years. So we are still a factor two away. And this is a little bit worrying, since we try to model carbon uptake by the oceans as well, another gas. And if we are wrong there, or heat uptake, many things, we try to model. And the, well, the oceans, we know the ocean is a key player in the climate system. And oxygen is maybe an ideal tracer, where we have lots of observations over the last decades. And this can be used and should be used to calibrate our climate models better. So there's homework for the modelers. And, uh, well, wherever we, we look, models underestimate the decline, and they actually also underestimate variability. Seasonal variability, interannual variability, El Nino variability, all the effects on oxygen are underestimated by all the best climate models by a factor two or more. So this is um, a reason for concern, but also, well, it's good that we have all the oxygen data now, and that there's more emphasis on studying oxygen in the ocean. I think it will help climate models to improve. And so possible causes, well, th there are some I, well, issues about data treatment. It's uh, still interpolating from very isolated data sources of different quality, maybe. So, so we, we have to check that as well, and we are doing this. But so far, we have no evidence that this is a major uh, reason for this discrepancy between observational estimates and model estimates. So solubility could be one reason. That would be the heat uptake. Uh, that would be really critical for climate models, or it could be biotic or circulation parts. Uh, looking at solubility first, from the data we see, this is, let's look at this panel here. This is the total oxygen decline in gray over the water column from the surface to 6,000 meters. So global ocean average decline. And the red curve, that's the solubility driven. So that's the warming effect over the last 50 years. And we see that on the surface, the decline, total decline is smaller than we would expect from the warming, the solubility effect, the champagne effect. So there's some feedback apparently stabilizing oxygen in the surface waters. Could be a reduction of respiration, a reduction of biological production and enhanced stratification, but could also be this ventilation effect in the tropical oceans that waters move faster through the thermocline. Then in the uh, deeper thermocline, essentially all of the loss uh, is explained or can be explained by solubility changes, gas solubility change, temperature effect. At depth, almost none is explained by the red curve. So this is must all the oxygen decline we observe at deeper levels, deeper than about 1,000 meters, 1,200 meters, is due to circulation changes or biotic uh, effects. We don't have any other explanation for that. What do the models again say? So here are our CMIP uh, IPCC models and the observational decline in blue. That's what we saw earlier. And now the red part, that's the solubility part, which we can diagnose from the data, so on the previous slide, and from the models as well. And here, well, fortunately, a relief for the models. The models tend to agree, pretty most models at least. So on average, there's a good agreement. Um, and well, we, we have models that do agree. Let's put it that way. Uh, so the red bars here are a similar magnitude, not a factor too different. And so the heat uptake, apparently, there's no reason to expect the heat uptake in the models is wrong. So that's, that's a relief, I think. Uh, so it must be something else, circulation or biology, which is wrong. And uh, this is the first hint. And now we can look at different regions. We uh, did that for the Equatorial Pacific. And here on this, uh, I looked at observational estimates for the upper ocean in green and for the deep ocean, deeper than 1,200 meters, the blue. And the bars here are the models. And so in the, in the tropical Pacific, uh, both models are wrong for the shallow and for the deep part. 
very bad, very poor performance. Other regions, Southern Ocean models are pretty good for the upper ocean, upper 1,000 meters, but they completely miss the large deoxygenation at depth. Almost all models at least miss it. Atlantic, South Atlantic as well, pretty good. The green bars and green line here, they seem to agree pretty well. Order of magnitude is right. But the deep observed deoxygenation is completely missed by the models. So it's something going on in the deep that the models don't get. And I think this is circulation, respiration. There's little evidence for enhanced respiration at depth, since metabolic effects will speed up respiration in a warming ocean. That means if we don't change the sinking velocity or sinking profile, respiration will occur shallower up in the ocean. So it will enhance respiration or oxygen consumption at shallower levels. And less material, organic matter arrives in the deeper ocean, and so less oxygen consumption by biology. That's what we at least see in the models, where we assume that there's no major change in the quality of particles and the sinking speeds and in the vertical distribution, basically, of mechanical sinking. So this is apparently the deep deoxygenation. I think it's uh, certainly not a solubility effect. That's what we have seen. But it, it's likely a circulation effect. And uh, I think this is uh, our major conclusion we have right now, that models do not get the circulation changes in the deep ocean right, if our oxygen observations over the last 50 years are right. So this is what we need to understand, the impact of circulation changes, particularly in the deep ocean. Of course, there may be overlooked biogeochemical feedbacks. And one of these uh, is now came, well, basically fall into our, onto our feet when we tried to extrapolate, to speculate what will happen now in the future. So what, what should we expect? The oxygen is going down 2% over 50 years. And if we extrapolate that, um, we also assume it gets worse with increasing warming. And right now, rates of warming still increase. Um, so we have the notion warmer climates have a lower oxygen content of the ocean, decreased solubility. That's what we have seen on average, probably a more sluggish ventilation for the deep ocean and maybe reduced export production. We have seen, or we have evidence from geological records, that there were anoxic oceans, at least anoxic ocean basins in the past, Cretaceous, uh, PETM, um, Paleocene-Eocene, Thermal Maximum. And so the question is, is there widespread anoxia to, ex to be expected in the future for the global ocean or for ocean basins, maybe for the Baltic Sea? <coughs> and we ran our models, global models, for then to until the year 8,000. So uh, extrapolating everything should be dead by the year uh, 4,500. Uh, so we really did a longer simulation here. And we see we did, uh, it's a business as usual scenario. So about 5,000 gigatons of uh, carbon will be burned altogether. So it's still a, well, that's the track we are on right now if we don't change our behavior. So there's a drastic warming by about 80 degrees. Uh, it, um, PCO2 goes, peaks until everything is burned and then slowly goes down. And uh, there's no sediments in this ocean. So this, uh, the real decline might be a little bit faster once sediments, uh, calc uh, calcium carbonate sediments dissolve. This is not included in the simulation. And the average ocean temperature goes up by about three degrees, so average global ocean warming. <laughs> Surprise, we see oxygen levels in this warmer ocean at the end are even higher than they are today. So we have a three degree warmer ocean average, but about 6% more oxygen in this ocean. After some, well, crisis period here, so for the next few hundred years, in, in our models, uh, oxygen levels really go down. And uh, we end up, uh, the minimum here is 20% less than today. Um, solubility part, we can uh, simulate that easily, so that's the three degree warming effect, and that leads to about 10% decline of the solubility uh, of argon concentrations, abiotic oxygen. But uh, the surprise is really, in the end, there's more oxygen in the ocean. So how come? Um, is it reduced oxygen consumption? That might be an effect, that we shut down biological production, so less respiration. 
This is not really the case. We see, well, biological production, we have here net community production, so that's basically what is available for export or for fisheries. Yeah, so everything, every net uh, surplus of organic matter. It goes down in the next uh, few hundred years uh, by about 10, 20%. But overall, it, it still increases. So the Arctic becomes more productive, and circulation rearranges in the end. In our models, at least, there's higher productivity in a warm, warmer world. More nutrients are utilized. There's more light and faster utilization of nutrients. Um, so this is, would even point to less oxygen, because more is produced, more will be respired. How come that we have more oxygen in this warmer ocean? And if we look at the patterns, here again in our model world, red is always the positive one. So we see more oxygen, the vertical average here in the Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean, and parts of the Southern Ocean. Uh, the depth section here, that's all, uh, zonal average in the ocean, shows particularly the deep ocean is enriched in oxygen in this warmer world. Surface, surface ocean goes down, so that's mostly the solubility effect, the warming effect. The surface waters can hold less oxygen, that's um, okay. But at depth, there's a huge increase. So this is a, 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 few, well, a few tens of micromolar on average, and this was a complete surprise to us. So despite this increase in net community production, despite the warming, and despite also some overall slowdown of the circulation, we see more oxygen in the global ocean, and particularly that at great depth. And this is um, the effect of well, circulation changes, but also of biogeochemical changes. And uh, this took me about a year to figure out that this was not a computer bug. <laughs> Well, there were many computer bugs I found on the way. That was good. Uh, but uh, we looked, I looked at, uh, tried the mass budget. What we, is always the first check when you do run a new model, uh, test is mass conserved. That's the only thing we believe in. Uh, biology, we don't believe in. And circulation, well, where we have so many fermentations mixing. Uh, but, but mass should be conserved. So we don't want to lose any atoms or gain atoms. And usually we do it for phosphorus. That's uh, our main currency. But, but here I did it also for oxygen and uh, was puzzled because the oxygen change, the red curve in the ocean, didn't match the air sea flux. The, so every oxygen that changes in the ocean must come out to the atmosphere, I thought at least. Um, and there's a discrepancy here. So there's less outgassing. Right now, well, there's outgassing from the ocean because the ocean oxygen declines. So it's, we can breathe a little more oxygen. Well, oxygen levels in the atmosphere still go down because we burn so much fossil fuel and consume oxygen that way. But um, the ocean right now helps us a little bit by releasing oxygen from the ocean to the atmosphere. And this uh, outgassing is, is too small in our model to explain the oxygen change in the ocean interior. So there must be uh, some, some oxygen, interior ocean oxygen source, which uh, I didn't think of when I draw, drew this, this figure. And indeed, it is the oxygen gain by denitification. So whenever organic matter is respired anaerobically, it leaves behind the oxygen that was well, photosynthetically produced at some time when the organic matter was formed. So denitification is, is, a, is a source of oxygen. And nitrogen fixation is a sink of oxygen. Uh, nitrogen fixation plus notification of the ammonium in the end. So when you complete the cycle. And when I did that, this uh, denitification gain exactly explained the discrepancy here and explained why the warmer ocean has a higher oxygen content. And uh, well, it is expansion of suboxic volume, so that these regions do expand two to threefold in this warming world, in, in, in our model world. And this leads to net decline of, of nitrate. And the global inventory of nitrate goes down by 17% by in our model, so quite substantial. There's less nutrients available for production. Somehow it doesn't matter doesn't really affect production. Right now, 
in the current world ocean, 50% of the nutrients go unutilized by production anyway, so they are subducted before they can be used, They're mostly in the southern ocean. But uh, the biology accesses only 50% of the uh, nutrient inventory, phosphate inventory. Rest goes unutilized. So this, uh, still, there's a 17% loss of, of nitrate. And, uh, well, if, if you do the stoichiometry, every single mole of nitrate lost uh, yields 1.4 moles of oxygen, because it's respiration does not use oxygen directly, it uses nitrate. And so it's a, it's a leftover, it leaves over oxygen, leaves behind oxygen. And, uh, well, we have uh, denitrification. Usually we think this will enhance um, nitrogen fixation in the end. There are stabilizing feedback in the ocean, in the world. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So why does nitrogen fixation not pick up? We see the time uh, history here. Well, first, net community production evolves, goes up a little bit. Denitrification goes up quickly with expanding low oxygen environments. But nitrogen fixation has a hard time to, to really close this feedback, to respond. And we always thought this would be a, a stabilizing feedback. Whenever we denitrify, we, the ocean produces nitrate deficits. Still, phosphorus is around, and nitrate deficits can be topped up by nitrogen fixation. That my, was my notion, at least, that uh, in the end, in, in our models, phosphorus is the key element. And the nitrogen cycle is just a slave of the phosphorus, and nitrogen fixers and uh, denitrifiers will battle it out. But, uh, and, but here they don't, for a few thousand years. So that's, uh, and this is about the overturning time of the ocean. So they should have enough time to really respond to see, hey, there's a nitrate deficit, I uh, can uh, have a, maybe a better ecological niche. This doesn't seem to happen. And this is uh, uh, maybe, well, the, the most exciting part, it's, it's uh, wh how, how the nitrogen cycle can have such a large, long-lasting imprint on oxygen. Uh, so we see, um, changes in nitrogen fixation rates. This is a global map of nitrogen fixation in year 8000 minus today. So we see red colors are expansion here, more nitrogen fixation. They move a little bit uh, poleward. And uh, in, in uh, both Atlantic, Pacific, Indian Ocean, all oceans show the same figure. There's a little bit less nitrogen fixation because uh, oligotrophic regions expand, so there's also less phosphorus available. But overall, nitrogen fixation increases, mostly at low latitudes. And that's where nitrogen fixes in our models or in our assumptions we, we have, we put in about nitrogen fixes, uh, can thrive. So they have oligotrophic regions where other phytoplankton cannot compete anymore. These are usually regions low in nitrate. Because again, other phytoplankton um, is limited then. And diastrophs, nitrogen fixers, grow more slowly. They need more energy to get rid of all the oxygen, and they have, to have a more expensive machinery to run. So on average, they grow about two to three times slower than, than ordinary phytoplankton. And the result is that this, what we call N star, this is the difference nitrate minus the red field equivalent in phosphate, so basically the excess or deficit of nitrate compared to, to phosphorus units. When this is positive, there's a surplus of, uh, of nitrate, so it's usually bad for nitrogen fixers, because then other phytoplankton can, can grow as well. When N star is strongly negative, there's a nitrate deficit compared to phosphorus, and then the ecological niche opens for nitrogen fixers, according to our notion how nitrogen fixation responds to environmental change. And so we see in the model, uh, the N star becomes very, very negative at high latitudes. Uh, so it should be a very good environment for nitrogen fixers to top up this nitrate deficit. They top it up in the tropics, so there's about zero, close to zero here. There was some local anomalies due to, to upwelling of denitrification signals and, and um, um, also 
strong seasonal nitrogen, uh, nitrogen fixation. But in high latitudes uh, and star, those nitrate deficits really they grow and seem to accumulate. High latitudes are also the regions of deep water formation, even in the warmer world. Uh, there's still ice, so it's still freezing point, particularly uh, mainly in winter, even in the Arctic, there's still winter ice. Uh, so that's where waters become very cold, they're still salty, and they sink to the deep ocean. And so these high latitude regions, they fill up the entire ocean with nitrate deficit waters. And for some reason, the nitrogen fixers, they can't grow, at least not fast enough, in these high latitude waters to basically top up the nitrogen deficit in these critical supply regions of deep ocean waters. In our models, this is because we, well, that's what we told the models to do. Nitrogen fixers, they can't grow at low temperatures that we put in the models, so they can't grow at temperatures colder than, lower than 15 degrees. They are limited by iron, that's scarce in at high latitudes, and uh, so they don't have a good chance really to, to thrive in these high latitude areas. And that's, I think, what uh, explains why nitrogen fixers can't really respond to increased levels of denitrification we see. They can't match, uh, they can't grow at high latitudes where deep waters form and where this nitrate deficit can basically via a loophole move from the denitrification areas in the tropical regions where they will leak into the southern ocean or part of this leaks into the southern ocean and they're subducted into the deep ocean interior and fills up over a long, well, millennia, fills up the ocean with de nitrate deficit waters. So this is the, the story we have about the uh, future. A warmer future ocean may well hold more oxygen despite lower solubility in this warming world, despite higher export production, despite expanding oxygen deficient waters. And uh, so enhanced denitrification, enhanced nitrate consumption in these warmer oceans is a net supply of oxygen and this seems to counter effect and even overcompensate the loss in these uh, expanding oxygen deficient waters. So this is a story about incomplete compensation of nitrogen loss by nitrogen fixation. And this is a thing we don't understand very well. So that's the f uh, ecological controls of nitrogen fixers. And that's, I think, what we can study in the, in the Baltic Sea very well, what we can, can st uh, study in the world oceans very well, and which is a very critical part that really controls the redox state of the ocean in the long term. And uh, this has, of course, implications for past ocean anoxic events. And there we see in our models, we can't model them. We can't model the Cretaceous anoxia. The ocean always gets uh, flushed by new uh, waters forming somewhere on the planet, and they usually form in cold environments where nitrogen fixation, in our ocean at least, doesn't happen, and in our models doesn't happen. And so we, we find it very difficult to maintain global ocean anoxia. We can produce these crises for a few hundred years, that's uh, maybe a reversal of the circulation, but we can't have sustained anoxia, at least not in our current models. And then it's a question back to um, paleoceanographers. How long were these anoxic events? Were these just f phases, critical phases of a few hundred years, or were they really sustained over a millennia? I think this is some, some critical information we can uh, utilize to better understand the redox controls uh, in the long term, which I think are really critically affected by, by how nitrogen fixation works. Thanks for your attention.